With me again, Louise Havala, showing you the truth about the legal profession and the amazing people that work in it. This week, we are diving deeper into the topics about cultural and gender diversity, the expression bamboo ceiling, the benefits of being a lawyer with Indian heritage, plus more. And who else to better shed a light on these topics other than Melina, Principal Solicitor at the Victorian Government Solicitor's Office, but you might know it as the VGSO. So I want to start off with what um, got you into the legal profession, what made you want to become a lawyer? So um, I'm originally from India and my whole family is in the profession. My grandfather was a judge and my father's a lawyer, my mom is as well. And, um, and lots of people in the family all from doing pretty well in the profession. I guess I just grew up with that dinner table talks about the profession, arguments over the table. I didn't quite actually want to be a lawyer, I think, when I was in uh, at uni. I was doing a commerce degree with uh, thinking about management and then I don't know halfway through I just got convinced now this is the right profession I really want to do it <laughs> and yeah and, and, and I did my law degree after that and started in the profession. Was there an expectation from your family that you will be a lawyer? Uh, I don't think there was an ex well there might have been but they never asked me to but I suppose it's it's not the conscious one <laughs> it's not like telling you you have to do this it's like it's subconsciously filtering it in yeah. <laughs> so you end up sort of it, taking that path which is always I was always told it's a really good profession for women you have the flexibility and it's so prestigious and things like that so yeah maybe <laughs> yeah and how long did you practice in India because you practice yeah. Lauren in India, how long did you practice uh, Seven there? years. Seven years. Yeah. And what year did you migrate to Australia? Uh, 2004. How did mm. you find the transition from India to Australia? What? Um, in terms of personal, uh, I mean, personally, it is a different country, but I travelled quite a bit. So, um, and, and I think Australia is quite open-minded. It was quite, quite good. My husband was born here, so I think it was easier for me. He had his family, so that transition wasn't too bad. But I think professionally, it does get a bit hard because you're not... Um, I'm not, you have to get accredited to be able to practice here again. Um, and I, when I came here, I thought I'll, I thought I'll take a break because I was starting a new life here. I came here because I got married. So I took a year and a half and did my master's of law, which I always wanted to do and I never got the time. Um, so I did that at Melbourne Uni and, um, and then I thought, well, yeah, I'll just sort of um, try and find a job. And that's when it all started getting a little bit harder. Because even though my uh, master's degree was there and I had good grades, I had to obviously do the six months of uh, training and four subjects to get accredited. And I started applying, talking to recruiters. Um, and I was told that my degree is really not going to be of <laughs> Indian the Indian qualification the experience are not going to be of much use. Master's is good. but. Um, yeah, I was also told that um, you should probably think about another profession. You'll never get a job in a, really? in a law, good law firm here. Yeah. You might have to try small or boutique firms or you may have to change your, you know, profession. Uh, so I think it was a, a, it was quite discouraging, but I, 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 I was, I'd always been a lawyer and I always wanted to be a lawyer. So I said I won't give up and I'll keep trying and pushing for it. So yeah, that transition was a little bit harder, but I got there and pretty quickly. And then after that, the step ups were pretty quick as well. So I had to start as a trainee with Clayton News, then move to Minters as an associate. And then, um, and then obviously with the government, I've been a principal solicitor with the Victorian government, been there for 10 and a half years. So I think the progression was quick, but getting in was hard. How did you get in? What did you do? Because I think you've told me this story before. But <laughs> tell me. Um, I, I was just trying. I was trying. I was talking to recruiters like yourself, and, and, and I, say, I, I tell this story always because one of the, the recruiters said, "Well, you won't just um, um, you know we can't really put your um, CV forward to big firms. It's difficult." And um, but I, I was using my contacts as well, like people I had met. And, and trying to get interviews separately with, with partners, um, not going through recruiters or, um, or going through the formal channels. Um, and I was just having chats with them about what I've done and what my experience is and what I can bring to the table. And I think that's what works better for me. And, and my, I, I, I got my first job at Clayton News, which was trainee. And then I moved to, um, to Minters. And at that point, that recruiter who told me I couldn't get a job called me up. And he said, oh, there's a position at, uh, uh, Phillips Fox, I think it was called then, uh, and and uh, so I, I'll put your name forward. I said, no, I've already got a job by Minters, and he nearly died. <laughs> He's like, how did he get that? <laughs> so I said, well, I did, <laughs> and yeah, it was uh, yes. 
I guess after that it was yeah once you get it in somewhere and a big firm I think it's easier but uh, as I said it's just you have to keep pushing and you have to try other channels if the formal channels are not working because you do quite a lot of networking have you always <laughs> done a lot of networking not so much when I came here um, because you don't know that many people I think my networking only started like maybe five years ago or something when my interest in a lot of my interests diversified in community work as well. So I think the networking sort of happens more when you're out there doing that work and talking at forums and meeting different people. So yes, I, I enjoy networking though. <laughs> Because I always see you around, and I think that's how we've met. At some yeah, of the networking yeah, it's on the events. I think yeah. at LIV as yes, well. Yeah, the LIV ones. Yeah. Um, and in terms of progressing from obviously making the progression up to your current position, how was that? How was that? How did you progress? Um, to, each, to each level? To each, each level, level, I think it's just you have got to. So with training, obviously, they soon realized I had the experience uh, from before. I wasn't at that level. So I guess. Um, the next position obviously associate and you sort of work there and then um, uh, but my move from private firm to government was uh, probably more because of the work-life balance and yeah. things um, and, and it's just brutally uh, competitive in big law firms and that's not the environment I really wanted to be in in the long term so I moved because of that but obviously it was a better position and um, and, and I suppose I had the experience already to do that so um, my previous background and then the experience that I gained here as well so which helped in getting me the role at uh, Victorian Government Solicitor's Office so um, yes yeah, so I guess <laughs> that's that's sort of the progression that I've had, but it hasn't been very dramatic though. <laughs> yeah. Did you find it at any point difficult transitioning from private practice to government, or was it easier than you expected? You no, know, it was all good because I'm in commercial practice anyways, commercial law. So that's pretty much similar. You're doing contracts, tender, procurement, that kind of. That's that's quite similar whether you're for the, working for the private sector or for the government. And um, with the government as well, I work on major projects. So on the other side will be the firms that I've worked with before. So you're pretty much doing the same work, but just being on the other side. We have to actually look at a lot more things than someone from private practice would look at because we've got to look at government policies and you know, with so many guidelines and you have the steering committees, the project groups and everything. So you're constantly sort of interacting. There's a lot more stakeholders as well. So I feel our job is harder uh, <laughs> with the government. But uh, yeah, and, and the government changes and things but yeah it, it is it's not as simple as a as two private contracting parties um, but I, I didn't find the tr transition uh, very hard no yeah. now you, I know you also do a lot of work with culture and gender diversity in yeah. different areas yeah. so across different industries tell me some of the issues you face and what you're doing to overcome these issues whether that be in the profession or yeah. the other areas you're focusing on uh, so with the profession uh, I guess it's pretty evident and you being a recruiter as well would we'll see that there's not that many people of diverse backgrounds in the judiciary or at higher positions in the legal profession as partners senior partners of big law firms and that seems to be a really I mean that is a big issue because if you look at our demograph we've got a lot of Asians uh, or people of different backgrounds uh, who are in uh, who are studying law and 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 you look at a lot of people on the streets it's just the streets are not reflective in different professions you won't see um, so as I said with lawyers it's not reflective in the upper echelons of the profession similarly for media or politics um, sports all these areas you will see that the diversity that you see in the general population is not reflected in the actual profession so but uh, so I've been um, so I've been doing that work in, in, in those various sectors as well. So um, I'm on, I've been involved with the Asian Australian Lawyers Association right from the start of that organization and we're working for greater diversity of Asians in mainstream um, well, law in, in the high echelons of the legal profession, uh, advocating for having more judges uh, from legal uh, Asian backgrounds or senior partners, just seeing more diversity in the profession uh, generally. And uh, but also I'm a convener of an organization called the Asian Australian Alliance and that's for diversity in all, all areas as well and politics and media and and you see in politics as well there's not that many people of Asian background who are in in the parliament whether it be uh, uh, state local state or federal 
Um, so, so that's uh, one area. And recently, I've started an organization called Multicultural Women in Sport, mm -hmm. and that's to get women of diverse backgrounds um, involved in sports as a means of empowerment, their well-being, and sense of belonging. Because again, that diversity is missing in sport, and that becomes really important for a country like Australia, where we're such a sporting nation, and sports is such a good leveler and sort of uh, a, a something that can bring people together. So, uh, you want to see more diversity in sports as well, and that's that's uh, another my my passion now so yeah yeah because you are quite passionate about it yeah. in terms of why isn't in the legal profession and even in, in sport yeah. why isn't it reflective of our culture it may be there's an unconscious bias we call it the bamboo ceiling so the yeah. bamboo ceiling is when you can't go up higher the bamboo reaches a certain point and you can't go up much higher and that's mainly because of the unconscious bias we face every day it may not be overt it may not be people on the street sometimes telling me go back from where you come from, but it can be unconscious as well in terms of prejudices that we have, or you know, just uh, preconceived notions about certain cultures or people. Um, so it's like you know, you may have heard. So the loudest person is in the Western cultures, the loudest person gets heard, whereas in the Asian cultures, the loudest duck gets shot. So you'll always see Asians more sort of. Um, subdued and, and they defer to authority, they will not raise their voices, uh, which uh, can be considered as a negative when you're in this environment where you want to be heard and seen and, you know, really be out there. So, so those are some of the, I mean, I guess people always looking for something that's similar to them. So, so that's one of the reasons why you won't see that much diversity in places because you always recruit people like you or you always sort of, um, uh, Maybe even you know, as you go up higher, it's the, as they call in the glass with the glass ceiling. It's the boys' club, whereas with the cultural one, it's all it's similar. Whereas you have people of similar backgrounds, um, we call it male pale still <laughs> sometimes. It's it's the white male people on boards or in senior positions, and you don't see people of diverse backgrounds there at all, or women. So um, yeah, so that's some of the some of the issues that we see all the time. How have you pushed through? This, the, the term bamboo ceiling because you're quite senior and you're on a number yeah. of boards and things like that. How have you pushed through it? I think you've just got to be confident. You've got to keep pushing, as you say, how, because you just have to push. So you have to do that. <laughs> it's the year of press for progress. You've got to press. <laughs> so, so you can't stop. Okay. And uh, you've got to be, I think one thing I've always found which has been useful is having pride in your own culture and your background. And that's what others will value as well. Because if you don't value your own culture or yourself, others are not likely to do that either. So the more you sort of um, so highlight the positives that you bring from your culture, as well as imbibe things uh, from the culture that you've adopted or, or the country that you've come into, I think that always helps in sort of having that combination and always being confident about it. And that, and 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 and, and we, I think all of us have our strengths. It's always about pushing forward your strengths and 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 your cultural strengths as well. I mean, I come from a place like India. India is the second largest growing economy in the world at the moment. So that's an advantage for me. I am I can be the connector for people uh, who want to, in, obviously Australia wants to grow trade. The Premier was there recently. They want to grow trade um, with India. So we come from backgrounds where it's really useful at the moment to be from those backgrounds, to understand the cultures, to know the language. We can be the bridge between between countries. So um, I, th I think we well placed to do that and others can sort of, if, if we keep saying, if we keep pushing that agenda, people will understand that we have, we can uh, bring value as well. Is there any other advantages of having that diverse okay. background and, and being from India? What have you found to be some of the other advantages? Well, as I said, uh, India is the second largest growing economy and I've been doing a lot of work in sort of bridging, uh, sort of creating greater bonds between the two countries in the legal profession and sports and various other areas as well. Um, um, but these this day and age, understanding two different languages, being bilingual is good as well, or multilingual. And also because um, we've got a huge Indian diaspora in Australia now. Victoria is, I think, the largest, and then you have uh, New South Wales got pretty pretty big diaspora, Indian diaspora as well. And I think uh, having that background and, and being in a position where I can, um, I'm connected to both this uh, being in sort of um, now at the higher level in, in, in the profession and also being well connected with the Indian community, I can sort of 
um, you know, tap into the resources of the Indian community as well. I'm sure they have a lot to offer and the businesses from the Indian communities are growing as well. So, um, and I know that mainstream would want to connect with them. So that's, that's a, probably an advantage, I suppose. Yeah. We meet so many lawyers that sometimes think that they're at a disadvantage because of their cultural heritage, yeah. but it's good getting opinion or yeah. from hearing from you because you've obviously pushed past yeah. You know, you've got the double ceiling, so the glass ceiling <laughs> and the, the Double bam. glazed, as we say. Some, uh, what friend, is it called? It's called a, a, a lady I know, and she's amazing. She's the CEO of Harcourt. She says it's the, the uh, it's double glazed. Double For women glazed. of diverse backgrounds, the, the uh, you know, glass ceiling is double glazed. So Have you ever believed it, though? I feel like you've just gone, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to put that to one side and just um, keep going. I suppose I do see it because people do say that it exists. Um, but I, 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 I'm, I, and I think I saw it in the beginning of the, when I joined the profession. But I guess you've got to believe in your capabilities and keep moving and sort of think, well, it does exist. Maybe it does exist. I'm just going to ignore it and I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and doing it well. That's so, good. Yeah. It's a good um, yeah. point of view you have yeah. and, and outlook. <laughs> and in terms of, you've, you've established an organization. You've mentioned it before. The Multicultural Women in Sport. Yes, tell yes. me more about this. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so, as I said, it is uh, to get women of diverse backgrounds um, a bit more involved in sports as a, as a means of their empowerment and their well-being and a sense of belonging in a country like Australia. So I've been um, uh, doing a lot of work with the big, uh, with all the big sporting codes like cricket, AFL. I'm a commissioner with AFL as well, by the way. And, and uh, uh, soccer and table tennis and a few others and sort of working on their, um, advising them on their multicultural uh, strategy on how to engage with women of diverse backgrounds and getting more people, uh, women of diverse backgrounds into their programs and also helping them modify some of their programs um, to get women, uh, to suit women of these backgrounds. And at the other level, at the grassroots level, I've been advocating uh, for um, for clubs to be more safe and inclusive for women, so sort of create, say like creating separate spaces for women when they're not comfortable playing in in male, uh, you know, where there's a lot of men around, or wearing a hijab and being able to play, um, having only women facilitators, umpires, and coordinators. So those kind of little things, or having diversity, like the diversity week is on at the moment. So having something around that time. Changing just the food culture in the club, just not having sausage rolls or party pies because there's a lot of migrants who don't eat that. Some don't eat beef and some don't eat pork. I didn't even so, eat that. <laughs> yeah, or some may be vegetarian. Yeah. So you have to have you have to be provide more welcoming environments for people of diverse backgrounds. So there's a lot of advocacy work that I do with with them uh, and the councils as well, local councils and, and the sporting, uh, um, uh, you know their sporting officers and talk to them and talk at various forums about how they can be more uh, safe and inclusive for women. Yeah. Have you seen any area or any industry or profession doing it very well or any other country doing cultural diversity well? Um, the US started before us so I think the cultural diversity there is much that issue has been addressed much better in in the US because they always think of color first and then the glass ceiling and then other things. Whereas we've uh, started, I suppose, with the glass ceiling a lot and the talk is still around that. Whereas our demographic has changed and we are not really addressing the issues of the cultural ceiling. So I think the US in that sense has done it well, although recently I wouldn't say that is the case with the change in presidency. But um, so th I, I think in terms of what profession, uh, sports is doing it better now. Like AFL is not doing it quite well. Um, they've got um, the AFL, AFL's women and they've got a good multicultural program which I've been involved with for years um, and uh, so I've been assisting a lot of clubs with their diversity policy. They're all very keen on engaging with the multicultural communities and not just at the level of getting more fans and things but also at the level of actually looking at issues that really matter for people of diverse backgrounds like refugees. They want to go and talk at schools, helps, help them through sporting programs to actually get into, uh, find jobs or apprenticeships. Uh, and things like that. So I think sports, some sports have been doing it well as, uh, too. And, and for other uh, others, I feel like, you know, just general professions like software engineering, or, you know, I, IT and things, they've just got people from diverse backgrounds because they, they, a lot of people do those degrees. So I don't think it's happened as a matter of, you know, policy or things. It's just happened because it's happened. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. How long do you think the profession will take <laughs> before it changes? 
Well, if it's, it, it will still take time. I think it's going to take time. I, I know you, you are aware of that LIV issue with uh, that uh, LIV journal, which had a three page pull out with all the women yes. leaders in the legal profession. Yes. So that's a positive. So you can see now there's a lot of women leaders in the legal profession, but still there was no women of color on that. Yes. So, so that was missing. But I think we're hoping that will won't take that as, as long as it took for that many women to be on the cover, for yes. another cover to be there where there's women or people yeah. of diverse backgrounds so hopefully it'll happen fast but and there's a lot of now there's a lot of push for it as well and I think people are understanding the value of diversity so there's the Diversity Council of Australia is doing great work there's a lot of organizations that now have the DNI committees within the organizations talking about these issues much more than before um, it may be that it's the start but uh, I think it'll happen faster now Hopefully, yeah. And in terms of service providers to the profession, so yeah. including um, recruitment agencies yeah. like ourselves, what should we be doing to promote more cultural diversity and gender diversity and addressing these issues? What should we be doing? I think uh, it starts at the education as well. So you may be uh, going to universities and talking to students at times. I think talking to them about um, the, the uh, what value they can bring and understanding from them what their strengths are as well and then pushing with the uh, with uh, you know um, with firms that these are the different skill sets that we have from uh, within our sort of fold and and these are the new students that are coming or, or, or you know we have people of diverse backgrounds sort of um, now entering the profession and they bring these and these and these skills so I think you have to push push the agenda a little bit because uh, when I started I'm talking 14 years ago I was told by a recruiter that I don't have a chance and that's very discouraging for to hear because I because then I'm not sure if a recruiter is telling me how what stand what chance do I stand so I guess it becomes it's, it's a sort of a responsibility in in some sense as well to try and push that agenda and see what um, and 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 educate maybe maybe the uh, the companies that you're presenting that that there is this cohort that is amazing and that they bring this value these values as well to to the organization that they'll be going to it's interesting mm -hmm. and it's interesting to see where we sit yeah to see it all unfold and, and i think it's 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 um it's something that everyone is responsible for recruiters of course but the education system themselves they've got to teach the kids that their value as well there's now a lot of law student societies that are now uh, organizing seminars and things on diversity and i was a speaker at one of them and I, so i know the students themselves within the, their own sort of groups are, are trying to push that agenda um, and it would be great if, if, if it was done at the university level at the you know uh, and there have been conferences recently organized even by Deakin and others to, to, to push that so I think uh, and, and then again the profession has to embrace that and the judiciary again so it's at all levels it, it has to happen from all angles everyone has to sort of chip in where they can and I know you're on a number of boards yeah. a number of committees and things like that um, how do you balance everything work, family, friends. I think I was after I told you before, I'm not quite sure I'm balancing <laughs> it, but I'm just doing it. it. But I, I feel that the, the more you take on, the more you're able to achieve, the more you're able to fit that in because you just don't have an option. You've got to just do it. If someone's told me that I've got to speak here at this particular time, I just, I know I have to have committed and I'm going to do it. I have to write this article and give it on this particular date. I just have to do it. And this, this meeting I have to go to, I just have to do it. So it's, it's, and I guess it's your passion. So when something's your passion, you don't feel like it's like a, you're trying to balance everything you just sort of you're doing it and of course work is work but the other things that I do outside of work I'm really passionate about so I don't feel like it's work so I feel that balance is there of course there's the family time I've got a daughter who's nine so so it's sometimes that takes me away from her um, uh, which I'm trying to <laughs> work on but there's she's growing up now she, so I can take her to some of the things that she's interested in and she's really big on sports as well so a lot of the sports stuff that I do I take her along with me so I, I and my husband as well he's he's very keen on sports so I guess you've got to find those balances in your own way and and in the way that you're passionate about things as well it won't be the same for everyone it'll be different on what your interests uh, and where your interests lie as well
It makes sense. And it's good that you can now bring your daughter to different events. Yeah. Does she like coming? Oh, yeah, she does. Not not for speeches. Boring speeches, <laughs> as she calls it. <laughs> oh, what's, what's boring? <laughs> Everything, I suppose, at the moment, which doesn't involve maybe something to do with, you know, interesting stuff for kids. But sports is good. She likes to um, go for sporting, uh, you know, for, for games and things like that. Or if it's if, if it's her favorite Darcy Visio, you know, is speaking somewhere, then she doesn't mind a speech as well. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we might change later on. Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of lawyers that are watching that um, look up to you and think, you know, Melina's done it. She's pushed through those ceilings, that glass ceiling and the, the bamboo ceiling. What words of wisdom would you give, I suppose, to help them if they're having self-doubts? And, and that's what I said. It's about confidence. It's about having the belief and always sort of um, striving towards excellence because if, if you strive towards excellence people won't be able to fold you on anything anyways because we have to constantly compete uh, with people um, from mainstream so uh, people of diverse backgrounds have to compete so if there's two people of the same level and one is of a mainstream uh, the other is of cultural from a cultural culturally diverse background there's chances that the person who's from <laughs> mainstream will be picked up. So you've got to, uh, I think, push constantly be, you know, have that extra edge. So your excellence will be the edge and confidence will be the edge and, and the, uh, the things that you bring with, the, the positives that you bring with diversity will be your edge. So I will always keep saying, as I said, imbibe the good values from, from, the, from the, the other cultures, but also highlight the good uh, things from your own culture. And I, I think that always takes you, takes you higher. There you have it. That is the end of this episode of Gatehouse Insights. Thank you for watching. And if you haven't already done so, please share this episode with your friends. And as always, make sure you subscribe to the Gatehouse Legal Recruitment YouTube channel and you can explore the world of the amazing people that work within the profession.